Welcome everybody to our second regular virtual network meeting of the Michigan Farmed Institution Network for 2020. And the Michigan Farmed Institution Network, for those who haven't been with us before, is a space for learning, sharing, and working together to make help farmed institution programs grow here in Michigan. And our local purchasing program, Cultivate Michigan, helps institutions source, serve, and track more local foods. And we're gonna go through our agenda today. Um, so we'll do some introductions and connecting first off, and then we have just a couple Miffin updates that we wanted to share, but the real uh, meat of our agenda today, and I'm sure what brings many of you here today, is talking about best practices for school and other food service operations, on farm food and worker safety and some perspectives on the state of the Michigan food system. So we'll leave time for us to have good conversations about all of those pieces. And we can certainly follow up more afterwards if there are any outstanding questions or information needs or follow up we need to do with our speakers. So I wanna thank all of our speakers today for taking the time to join us too. Diane Golzinski with the Michigan Department of Education will share about their new resource on those best practices for schools and other food service operations serving meals during the coronavirus pandemic. And then Mariel Boardman with MSU Extension Community Food Systems will share some resources on on-farm food and worker safety during this time. And then we're lucky to have Noelle Knackreiner. Noelle, am I saying your last name right? You absolutely are, yes. Great, thank you. We're just, I'm just meeting Noelle for the first time virtually today. We've communicated over email. So thank you, Noelle. She is the executive director of the Michigan Agriculture Council. And Heather Ratliff of Cherry Capital Foods will be sharing her perspective today as well. She's also a advisory committee member for the Michigan Farmed Institution Network. And then we'll share just a quick um, bit of information about our calendar for the year, which at this point, is fairly light um, so that we can be responsive as we go and we'll finish up for sure by 12 noon um, and we'll see how it goes. So our roles for um, our team today, those of us who are bringing this meeting to you, I will be the meeting facilitator. My name is Colleen Matz and I'm the Farmed Institution Specialist at the MSU Center for Regional Food Systems and I coordinate the Michigan Farmed Institution Network. And we have Garrett Ziegler of MSU Extension and the Miffin management team. He is our moderator today, coming to us from Iceland there, or Grand Rapids. And he'll be managing Zoom and the chat box. And Abby Harper of MSU Extension and the Miffin management team is our note taker today. So your role for today is to actively listen and participate mainly through the chat box when prompted, but we'll have some time for Q&A and discussion after all of our presenters have a chance to speak as well. So let's practice using the chat box now. And if you can add your name and affiliation to the chat box, we'll have a sense of who's here today. So lots of folks joining us today. I'm not gonna read through everybody, but looks like we got a lot of extension folks, center folks, um, some folks from all over the state, the UP, obviously all our great speakers lined up for today. Um, folks from local health departments and food councils. Great. Looks like we have a good um, cross-sector representation for farm institution work here on the line today. So thank you. Okay. And 
next also in the chat box just a minute to connect with each other can you in the chat box write which spring food you're most excited about and your favorite way to prepare it All right, some folks uh, mentioning sugar snap peas, eating them right off the vine. That is delicious. Um, salad mix, mix from Jay. Uh, radishes, um, grilled asparagus. That is a delicious way to eat asparagus. Um, another, I think another vote for radishes. Um, snap peas again, uh, strawberries. Um, mm. Jam way, yeah, that's delicious. Uh, more asparagus roasted with lemon. Yum. Uh, Noel uh, mentioned morels. I was wondering if I didn't get any morels um, with eggs. Yeah. Some spring greens with just a little lemon. Another another foraged food from Colleen. Ramps on pizza. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, ramps in everything from Tony. Uh, rhubarb. Yum. Sauteed and on pancakes from Mario. Fresh greens from Diane. Another uh, some more ramps coming up. Lots of ramps. Ramps, ramps, ramps. Um, <laughs> asparagus again, morel, morel mushrooms, strawberries. Yeah, those are all awesome. Delicious, making me hungry for sure. I didn't eat enough for breakfast today, so. What's your favorite, Garrett? I'm probably gonna have to go with asparagus. Um, and yeah, it's just so good grilled. Um, I actually make a really nice asparagus, shaved asparagus frittata. Mm. That's tasty. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And I wanted to, as we're still working in the chat box here, I wanted to turn it over to Caitlin Wojak with MSU Extension. Um, she has a quick little survey link for us today too. Thanks, Colleen. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. So I just posted, um, it should be the last thing in the chat, a quick demographic survey that's from our MSU Extension colleagues that help support the network. And we just appreciate it if you could fill it out. It helps us to understand who's participating in our programs or programs that we're supporting as we work to have more representative and inclusive programming. So if you can hop on over to that link, we'll leave a second for everyone to do that. I'll go do it now too. And I got a note from Xavier Jeremillo, who is part of our advisory committee. He is driving, so he's not going to be able to complete this right now. But thanks for that note, Xavier. Glad you're with us today. Okay. Thank you for helping us out with that survey today. And we're going to try to figure out a um, good way, if it's not this, um, we're not sure, to um, do a similar survey like that at every meeting, just so we're able to track who's attending a little bit better. Okay, so moving on to the next. As we're talking about spring foods, just a reminder that we have a whole suite of spring featured foods through Cultivate Michigan. Um, over the years, we've featured asparagus, milk, kale, eggs, onions, and beef at this time. And for those who are looking for sources of any of those products, you can find some of them in our sourcing guide, primarily from food distributors, uh, food hubs, and that includes some broadline distributors too. Just a plug for our sourcing guide. And as we transition into our speakers, I just wanted to share some quick information 
based on what we learned through a little survey that we did with our membership, with members of the Michigan Farms Institution Network, we sent out an optional Google survey, just a quick survey, to try to check in with people to see what their needs were at this time, knowing that they're different than normal times, the before times, as some of us call it, um, and wanting to be responsive to needs that are out there. So I won't go into all the things that we learned in that space. We just had a handful of responses and we appreciated a handful of responses and tried to individually follow up with those folks. If we haven't followed up with you yet, you will um, get someone reaching out to you shortly. But what we saw there as top needs at this time were developing strategies and tactics for meal service or delivery, dealing with labor shortages, and ensuring worker safety. So we wanted to um, at least address in part um, some of those top needs with our meeting today. And as needs evolve and change over the coming months, we can do the same with our next um, network meeting. So we don't have any plan set in stone for our upcoming network meetings and we hope to be responsive in those spaces too. So at this point, I'm going to introduce our friend Diane Golzinski with the Michigan Department of Education. She is the director of the Office of Health and Nutrition Services there. And she's going to talk about a new guidance document that the Michigan Department of Education and Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development have put out into the field um, to provide some of these best practices. But I wanted to stop sharing my screen here now so I can show you all how to get to this document and where it lives. So if you can follow along here, um, I approach, this is my approach to this document, Diane. You can let me know if yours is any different. But on the unanticipated school closures, summer food service program information web page of the Michigan Department of Education website, um, you will find a number of helpful bits of information. And at the bottom here, there's a whole set of resources that can be linked to from this page. So the um, unanticipated school closures, summer food service program for those who aren't knee deep in the school food scene um, is the food service program that schools are operating now. While they're closed as for education, some are still open for providing school meals um, or meals and they're operating through this program. So under their resources, this document is available under food service and food safety recommendations, but you'll see that there's a lot of helpful information here otherwise, including the locator map to find um, programs, sites where food is being provided through schools and through other sponsors right now. And this site map will be updated as more information is gathered for the summer food service program as well once school, the official school year is over. So I'll pull up this document now and turn it over to Diane. Diane, I know this is just kind of the memo header here. So here we'll go to this page. So let me know if and as you need me to scroll here. Okay, sounds great. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you. It's great to be talking with friends who um, understand exactly what we're trying to do during this time. And thank you for all that you are doing to support our farmers and our producers and distributors and everyone in our food chain right now. Um, so as Colleen said, we are feeding kids right now through something called the unanticipated school closures, which is the same provision of the summer food service program, which allows us to feed kids on snow days. So believe it or not, I never thought I'd be happy to say that we lived through a polar vortex, but we lived through a polar vortex and we figured out how to actually administer this program, which we had never done before. So the polar vortex allowed us the opportunity to be able to get this program up and running 
the governor announced at 11 p.m. on Thursday, March 13th, that schools would be closed for three weeks. And by 11 a.m. on Friday, March 14th, we were able to be on the phone with superintendents, helping them understand exactly how we could feed kids at this time. Within about a week, we started getting a lot of questions about how do we keep the workers safe who are providing these meals to kids. In those two weeks in March, we are up over 9 million meals were served by different sponsors around the state, which is a great, incredible feat to have turned it around that fast and made it happen. But that also meant that we had hundreds, if not thousands of food service workers who were exposed to the public and to others and risking their own. How do we keep them safe? How do we make that work? So this document came out and it's unfortunate that one of the things that happens through a crisis like this is that information be can become outdated within 24 hours. So we had developed this document, had it run through all the appropriate approval channels, were literally getting ready to hit send when the Department of Health and Human Services announced that they do recommend that folks wear face masks. And as you might know, just as of this week, it's now recommended that face masks are worn by everyone at all times. So even that changes quickly. So some of these things, as we look, as we go through this, um, we may have better and more updated information since this was created on April 6th. But so far, it's important to note that there have been no food transmissions of COVID-19. COVID-19 has not been proven to go from one person to another through food. And that was one thing that we really wanted to make sure that was clear. The other part of this, we co-wrote this with the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development because they are the legal food service authority for the state of Michigan, or food safety authority, excuse me, food safety authority for the state of Michigan. And one of the things that they continue to tell me over and over and over again are some of the safest places to eat because the folks who work in school food service know and understand food safety very, very well. So a lot of what we needed to just remind our folks in the field of is that you already know how to wash your hands how to clean and sanitize. You already know how to keep food safe, how to prevent cross-contamination. All of those key standard operating procedures were already in place. And we just needed to help folks remember that just because we're dealing with a respiratory illness that is horrible, that doesn't mean that those standard operating procedures needed to change. We just may needed to change some other things. So what you're going to see here is the first thing that we wanted to address was screening staff and volunteers. A number of food service staff were refusing to come in or were laid off. I talked to one food service director in Southwest Michigan whose entire staff was laid off and he was the only one creating 9,000 meals every, day, every week and distributing to his students. That was, he was the only one his district would allow to work. In other places, coaches, uh, sports teams, teachers, other administrators were all coming in and trying to help food service create and distribute tens of thousands of meals. In Southeast Michigan, our largest school districts, some of them were distributing, are distributing anywhere between 100 and 120,000 meals at a time. And so, yes, you need a whole horde of volunteers, but how do you, in the hotbed of the coronavirus portion of the state, also get enough people in and keep everyone safe to make that happen? So things like screening when they come in, taking temperatures, asking the questions, how do you feel? Have you been exposed to everyone? Anyone out there who's had this, that type of question were really important to help folks recognize that if we ask that up front and folks are honest, 
then we can be even more protected as we move along. We have heard complaints from food, I had one food service director who called me who said they had a worker who was actually showing symptoms for two days, still coming to work before they reported it. Even though they had these screening questions, they were lying on these screening questions as they came to work every day. So just helping food service directors work through those things was really important. Colleen, we can move down to the next portion. Thank you. Routine cleaning is the next portion. Again, it goes to cleaning and sanitizing surfaces and making sure that everyone is using the same disinfectant, the same processes that they were already using. And then we moved into personal hygiene, making sure that everyone had access to their hand washing stations and proper hand washing stations, that everyone who was working had the time to stop and wash their hands in between being ex or possible exposures to then moving on to another task. We had a lot of questions about should these workers have N95 masks? Should they have gloves? Should they have personal protective equipment? At the time this was written, there was such a shortage of personal protective equipment for the medical community that we were very, very careful not to recommend personal protective equipment for food service because the medical community needed it first. As we continue to move through this, there may be additional options for face shields or other types of personal protective equipment that food service may start employing. At this time, we're working on social distance, making sure everyone stays six feet apart, making sure that they have the right um, ability to wash their hands. Uh, we even recommend that if folks come to work and work out with the public, that once they go home, they immediately wash those clothes and take a shower prior to then being exposed to their family. So um, again, masks, at the time this was written, masks were not even recommended for even the essential workers. Then I did add in a bullet, even though it wasn't approved by the uh, powers that be, but I edited it anyway, about just that day, masks were recommended. And so we linked to that guidance that was provided. Social distancing was another very important thing because we had thousands of families coming in to get meals. And how do you stay six feet apart? when you're handing someone a bag of food? How do you, in some cases, some districts were using a roster to actually check the names of the students off that they were providing meals for. And so how do you get that information from the family and check it off and still maintain that six feet of distance? So we were working hard on trying to help folks recognize that you could put up a table set the number of meals on the table and then step back and then the family could come up and take it off of the table. Or you could require that the family open their trunk and you put the food in their trunk and the family never gets out of the car. Um, anything so that we could try to protect the workers from being more exposed to the public. We offered everyone the ability to offer the number of meals on the number of days that worked the best for them. Some districts are serving so many meals that they just simply can't do less than three times a week um, for distribution. Well, that's more exposure to the public. And so that's what worked for them. But if someone could go down to once a week distribution or even once every two weeks, then that was something that we were highly recommending. Um, again, setting up traffic cones or tape so that people stayed far apart. We did have some issues with crowd control at some sites. Um, Oxford community schools in particular would run out of meals. They would serve anywhere between 1,700 and 2,000 meals at a single distribution and they would run out. And then people would congregate and get angry in crowds. And so how do we then separate that crowd from the workers to try to protect the workers and yet not cause any other type of community disturbance there? 
We had a few instances where um, delivery drivers didn't want to deliver to some locations, especially in Southeast Michigan, where we had the most cases running at one time. And so how do we help those delivery workers stay safe, as well as the staff who were accepting those deliveries and practicing that social distancing? Now everyone should be wearing masks and they should be changing their gloves in between getting any of those types of deliveries. And then we linked to a few resources at the end. So this document, like I said, it wasn't, um, it wasn't incredibly comprehensive because at the time we were going off of the information that we had. If I have the ability, I will go back and actually update this document with new information. I may ask someone on my team to do that now that I say it out loud, but that's, um, that's what we have in really working, trying to keep families safe, as well as keep the workers safe who were trying to get these foods out to families. Thank you, Diane. You're welcome. And if you have some time to hang on for some questions and discussion, we can Absolutely. open it up. So um, if folks want to add to the chat box, if you have questions or notes or maybe um, additional bits of information from your expert perspectives too, that would be great. While we wait for questions, it might be helpful for folks to know that yes, we are thinking about what the fall might look like, whether or not schools may be back in session, if they are in any way, what, how do we then also help protect everyone? I can't imagine that salad bars or share tables will be anything that we would recommend until we're back to full capacity, but it's, it's on our, it's weighing on our mind heavily. So my question, um, and I know yesterday you were saying that your crystal ball wasn't working so well, but, uh, <laughs> if you could, Think about, and I trust you already have thought about, what this, what changes to school and changes then to school food could look like. What does that mean for farm to school and what are some of the opportunities there? Yeah. Get the bright side. Absolutely. So a couple of things that I've seen come out and if, and I'd be happy to put some links in the chat box for everyone. Um, CDC has a a number of things of um, potential guidance for what school might look like when it comes back until we get to the point of having a vaccine where we can try to protect uh, the public more often or, or better, I guess is a better way of saying that. But um, no field trips is recommended. So if there's no field trips recommended, what are our opportunities for getting kids to the farms to understand what farm to school is or where their food comes from? Um, United Dairy Industry of Michigan did a virtual farm tour, tour for dairy cattle. Um, maybe that's what we have to start thinking about is more virtual farm tours that could still get to kids in some way. Um, I think that there will be a lot of demand. So one of the things that we've been worried about is if you look at um, in the locations in the world that have gone back to school, Scandinavia is the example that I use. NPR did a whole story on school going back to school, kids going back to school in Scandinavia. The kids are going back, they're split in half. Half the kids go half the time. The other half of the kids go the other half of the time. And I know that's what my husband's school is talking about. Maybe half go one week and the other half go the next week. In this particular story, it was a group of kids went Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, and the other group went Tuesday, Thursday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So everything will have to be repeated. Everything that happens can't now happen one time and expect to get to all kids. So how do we support the educators? Where are our opportunities to support the educators in repeating information? Because if any of you have ever had to do a webinar twice or a teaching of anything twice, 
you know you say it different the second time. You get different questions from the kids the second time, and then not everybody ends up with the same information, right? So how do we think through some best practices for sharing of information if the kids are split up and not all at school at the same time physically? Or if they are doing any kind of remote or distance learning, where are our opportunities there for the kids to have exposure to that type of thing? But then I've also seen where um, this particular story in Scandinavia and also in the CDC recommendation is that kids no longer eat in the cafeteria. They would eat in their classrooms. And I will tell you whether I agree with it or not, the first thing a food service director's brain goes to is, well, then I need everything individually packaged. I need everything so that it just looks like it came out of a vending machine and I'm just gonna pass it out to the kids, right? So now we're talking everything from sustainability for packaging. We're talking to how, you know, the, those districts that actually went back to real trays and real flatware, now what do they do when that goes to the classroom? Are they gonna to go to disposable everything? And again, what do we do for the environment in that situation? How do we help districts think through menus and food options that don't have to be just these individually packaged smuckers, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? You can tell the dietitian in me is coming out really strong right now. I'm having a hard time with that. And then as Phil just said, food allergies, right? My kids with their peanut allergies and yeah. So <laughs> there's all kinds of concerns if we can't have the kids in the cafeteria. And then traditionally what we've done is put up clings on the salad bars or had signs about the farmer that we're featuring that week or things. Now all of a sudden you might need 60 of those to go to classrooms or it might, those resources might need to look different. Mm -hmm. hey, that was a really long answer, I apologize. <laughs> That's fine. Jay, did you have a question? I do, hi Diane. Uh, hi. Thanks for all of the work that you're doing. Um, it's, it's really important and I've been hearing your name in many circles, so. Um, <laughs> you're, okay, you're fantastic. <laughs> Um, I, I'm a bit concerned uh, with that story and I experience it too with some of the farmers that I work with with that story of like the employee coming to work for two days sick. Yes. Um, and I'm trying to think about like what kind of incentive we can give our employees to stay home and my mind first goes to like education, sure. like being like you get paid time off. Yes. <laughs> like, uh, and I'm wondering if that's the best. Yeah, they do. Two weeks, everyone gets it if they're sick. Thanks, federal government. Um, is that being addressed and shared with the employees? That's a great question. Um, it hasn't been promoted by me, and I think I need to do a better job of that. Now that you're saying it out loud, I'm thinking, oh, I've missed that point. It's it's something that, um, because I don't deal with it, I don't think of it, right? But I need to do a better job of that. But then also looking long-term. You know, we're typically dealing with a group of employees who have been marginalized for a long time, as many of us, those that we work with, have been. Um, paid minimum wage and not been respected for the work that they do. And yet they're the first ones that we all thought of as soon as schools were closed that we're gonna need to step up and take care of this. So how can we elevate the work that they do to the level of importance it really is and help all of them feel that sense of importance? Because I think once you feel a sense of importance for what you do, you have a different level of respect for coming to work sick versus not coming to work sick. Yeah. And then also assuring that they continue to have paid sick leave, that they continue to um, be responsible for taking that paid sick leave. I know that there's a lot of concern with taking paid sick leave because there just aren't enough workers. So if I stay home sick, who's going to feed these kids? How does that happen? And so really just, we've got to flip the narrative. 
we've got to help our food service staff know and understand their role, but also their role of staying home when they are sick and assuring that they have a way of paying their bills when they do that. Yeah, and that they're, um, by staying home, they're not gonna put extra pressure on their colleagues yes. because we can do X, Y, and Z to exactly. mitigate yeah. that. Yeah, before this all started, we had a horrible shortage in school food service. I would talk to districts who'd have 30 to 60 openings at any one time. And so they were already going to a lot of pre-prepared foods because they no longer had the staff capacity to do the homemade things that they wanted to do. And then this hit and fewer people came to work and things. So it's a, it's a concern throughout the industry. Yeah, cool. thank you. Thanks for that question, Jay. And with that, um, and for the sake of time, I think we're going to move on to our next food safety topic on the farm. But thanks again, Diane. And I think that gives us a lot, all of us, a lot to start thinking about how we can contribute to what school might look like in the fall and for next year. So thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. So now I will turn it over to our friend Mario Borgman, who is with MSU Extension Community Food Systems, and she has some information to share about on-farm food and farm worker safety during this time. Mario, take it away. All right, thanks Colleen. Um, so I just wanted to actually start off by reiterating what Diane explained in her presentation that currently we have no evidence that uh, there's any association of transmission of COVID-19 through food or food packaging. Um, Foodborne exposure is not known to be a route of transmission, uh, but we have a lot of concerns from our farms around Michigan of what they can do to maintain food safety in this time and also uh, safety of their workers, very similar to what we just heard in Diane's presentation. So today I'm just going to share some resources and uh, some action that's taking place with organizations across the state to help support our growers. Next slide, please. Um, so in Michigan, we actually have a statewide network that focuses on on farm produce safety. And this collaboration was established about four years ago in response to the Food Safety Modernization Act, or FISMA, um, when a need was really identified to have a statewide training and resource network for farmers. So uh, this established network has really allowed us to pivot very quickly into the creation and curation of pandemic response resources and education. So this collaborative is made up with folks from MSU Extension and three of us are actually on this call today. So myself, uh, Garrett Ziegler and Jay Gerhart are all members of this team. Um, we also have folks from MDARD, um, from the Michigan Conservation Districts. We have uh, regional produce safety technicians in Michigan that work through the conservation districts. And so this is kind of the team that's really been taking on the FISMA response in our state for the past several years and now has really jumped into providing training and resources uh, in dealing with this time of pandemic. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to note that Mariel has a little person at home, so I think some of those um, fun noises are coming from Mariel. Can you hear them? Oh, <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. I just wanted folks to know that um, I'm not going to mute those noises because they're coming from your house. <laughs> All the way in the other room, too. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. Getting back here. Hold on one second. There we go. Um, so I wanted to share this website with everyone. This is kind of our MSU Extension Clearinghouse website for everything produce safety related. And I'm going to actually pop a link in the chat box to the section of that website that has specific food safety and COVID-19 resources. Um, so on this website, we have a collection of both resources that have been developed by um, the team I just mentioned, as well as our partners around the state at MIFS, um, at Michigan Agritourism. 
And um, then there's also a curation of resources for or from other extensions around the country um, that have been putting out resources uh, related to different aspects of farm food safety related to things like you pick farms, farmers markets, uh, food service, even grocery stores and food banks. So there's some general information on there as well and then some very specific information for growers in um, different types of market settings. And we recently did a series of two webinars, um, one aimed at produce safety for small growers in the age of COVID-19 and one um, for those that have UPIC operations and farm markets. And those web webinars are available um, to download from the website, or to access, I'm sorry, the recording of those from the website. Um, if you have growers that you know who might be interested in that, or if you're interested in learning more about what's going on in those types of markets. Um, next slide is another resource related to uh, specifically vegetable farms. Our vegetable educators at MSU Extension have put together a fantastic list of resources for vegetable farmers and this is getting updated uh, as quickly as possible. So you can see where I have it circled. Um, they're always putting the current update and so they've updated it. Uh, what was that? What's today? Thursday? Wednesday? Today's Wednesday. So Monday was the last update. I have no idea what day it is this, these days. Um, so they're trying to keep that as current as possible. As we all know, things are changing super quickly. Um, so that's a really great, just like one-stop shop for vegetable growers to get all of the latest information. Next slide, please. Okay, so farm food safety has changed as the pandemic has unfolded. And those farms that had gone through some kind of food safety training, planning, or certification program prior to the pandemic are much better prepared to quickly implement the kinds of changes and protocols to protect their workers and um, follow the best practices for food safety that have changed in recent weeks. Um, so we've really, we've seen a, a stark difference between those farms that had some sort of training or planning process in place versus those that um, are just now trying to figure this all out um, in the wake of a pandemic. So the best practices for food and farm worker safety have um, been modified in a couple of pretty important ways. So, uh, and some things have stayed the same. So many farms were already practicing really good hand hygiene and sanitation practices prior to the pandemic, especially those that had gone through um, programs like the Michigan Produce Safety Risk Assessment or a, a GAP audit. Um, but now uh, farmers are being advised to add practices like disinfecting non-food contact surfaces um, and surfaces that are um, what we're calling high touch surfaces. So things like doorknobs, um, the, the faucets and hand washing facilities and bathrooms, um, things like that, that were uh, maybe done not on a regular basis. And now we're uh, advising folks to do that pretty frequently, uh, at least two times a day to disinfect those high contact surfaces. Um, some other things that have changed is typically in farm food safety protocol, uh, illness reporting is very important for symptoms of foodborne illness as it is in institutional food settings. Um, and obviously that has now been modified that workers must report and stay home if they're experiencing any of the COVID-19 symptoms. Farms are also uh, trying to do their best in getting the work done with social distancing in place. So in the picture on the right hand side of the screen is a farm um, near Battle Creek, Michigan, Green Gardens Farm. And you can see uh, they have a small crew there who is trying to maintain social distancing. The crew is wearing masks. So uh, we're really advising that farms try to split crews up into smaller units so that people uh, can effectively practice social distancing, um, maybe splitting into groups of people who live together or carpool together, uh, staggering shifts 
maybe adding more shifts for the crews uh, so that they can be in smaller groups um, and staggering breaks so that people aren't hanging out together or tempted to, to be in too close a proximity. Um, other things that are being added are, um, well, I mentioned masks. Uh, masks are something that agricultural workers uh, need in certain circumstances anyways, for example, um, applying chemicals or pesticides and things like that. So some farm workers actually are required to wear respirators, but uh, all farm workers now are advised to wear some sort of face covering given the new executive order. Um, let's see. We'll go to the next slide. So I wanted to also point out uh, these resources that Michigan Food and Farming Systems has available. They're actually curating a pretty extensive list of COVID-19 resources from uh, Michigan and, and beyond. And many of those resources are available in Spanish. So I'm gonna pop that link in the chat box as well. Um, and there's a way for folks to add resources to this if you know of any um, that are not on there. So that is another really excellent resource that is being updated frequently and consistently. And finally, I just wanted to uh, give contact information for myself and for Garrett Ziegler. Uh, we're both members of the MIFIN management team and uh, can serve as farm food safety contacts if you have questions or need any resources. Um, we'd love to to get you in touch with uh, what you need. And I would also like to invite Garrett and Jay to uh, participate in the Q&A if we have time for that. Um, so they are also uh, really knowledgeable in this subject. So I want to make that available as well. Thank you, Mariel. So are there any questions, burning questions about on-farm food safety? And maybe, Mariel, if you have some sense of, um, as we're waiting for questions, what do you see coming next in terms of resources or information that you all will be tackling as a group? Hmm. Good question. And it's okay if you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of anything specifically on the docket right now, but maybe Jay and Garrett can think of something. We're trying to basically just pump out information as quickly as possible. So a lot of this has been put together within a couple days yeah. from a conference webinar. So we're just trying to get things to farmers as quickly as possible. I guess one thing we've been working on are um, online, helping farmers set up online platforms mm -hmm. for doing sales if they don't have that available yet. Um, we don't have anything formal quite ready to go on that, but I know that Jay's working on some resources. Jay, had, anything you wanna share? Uh, we, we had a, or I guess I presented for like 10 minutes within our UPIC and Farm Market webinar that we did last week on pivoting online and starting these online marketplaces. Um, I definitely think that that information could be expanded What's great though, is that there's already a lot of other folks who've pumped out resources and guides at this point. Um, the best one that I, there's two, um, Cornell Small Farms Program, as we can all, uh, as, as we all know, is fantastic. And they have a, fan, uh, like a wonderful repository of links and things. And then the National Young Farmers Coalition has put out a beautiful, guide with pictures and charts comparing these different online marketplaces to each other. Um, so that's, that's, that's definitely a hot, a hot item. I think that as farmers, like as employees start to come on farms, these, their interns might start be starting to come on farms, like really helping these farmers um, learn how to screen their employees uh, is, is and, and how to manage employees, like Mariel said, with these cohorts and things like that to reduce risk um, is gonna be critical. Thanks, Jay. And for those who don't know you, um, can you introduce yourself? <laughs> sure, I, uh, I, I work with MSU Extension down in Washtenaw County. 
Um, I'm a bit of an interloper on the food safety team. Um, my, my main job is to help farmers and food businesses make more transactions in local markets. Professional interloper. Garrett, anything to add? I was just gonna say that, um, you know, like Mariel said, so much of this is is like reactionary to, to the updates and what's happening. Um, I mean, you know, for the longest time, we didn't know if people were gonna be able to sell plants um, from their farms and garden centers and all that. And then that, you know, we had like three weeks of people kind of freaking out about that. And then the latest executive order came out um, end of April, like, I guess last Friday, um, that basically said, yes, you can sell plants. And everyone's like, okay, like, thanks, you know, for like allowing us to sell plants now. And it's like all that freaking out for three weeks was really for, for not because there wasn't, I don't think a lot of people really buying many plants or wanting to buy plants in those couple of weeks when the weather was crappy anyway. So um, yeah, just to say that, that, you know, we're really reacting as, as quickly as we can to, to serve farmers and to update them on um, what resources are available and how they can, you know, best um, safely serve their customers um, and make sure their their employees are safe. And and just to point out that, you know, from what we've all seen, like farmers are super innovative and have done an amazing job in my mind to to figure things out, um, to 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 be react, you know, to try and get ahead of things as quick as much as they can, but um, you know, to really react when they need to and 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 are doing a great job of producing safe food as they always have. And it looks like Lindsay added the link to the resource from the Young Farmers Coalition and Mariel added a couple of links um, to, to the MSU information and to the MIFS information. So you can access those resources in our chat box. And I think we have a question also. Phil is asking, have any buyer requirements changed? Hmm. As far as Phil, like lessening their requirements or are they looking at, you know, versus not, maybe not looking at gap, but looking at other food safety specific things around, around COVID. Yeah. I was just asking if any, you know, this, this, these are all great guidance. Um, things and, and stuff like that but have any has any of that come from the buyer side of things as well saying hey if you want to sell to us you have to do x y or z i know we have some buyers on the line here and some additional um folks from mde so maybe those folks could respond from their experience I can call on, I would say, I think I see Maureen there um, and Marco and even the food hubs um, might know more information from that space in between. They're both buyers and sellers. I can comment. Uh, as far as I know, and I've talked to several different buyers recently, <clears throat> um, they have not been asking for uh, any additional uh, safety measures from us. Uh, as far as on our end too, I've, I've talked with a few growers. Um, everybody is still, you know, because we're in Northern Michigan, getting prepared. Um, they're taking safety steps as far as uh, screening workers and that type of thing coming in. Um, for the most part, food safety and our food safety standards and the measures that most everybody uses, I think, are, um, you know, fairly, are really good. Uh, we're already doing a lot of things that we've been required to do. So um, I don't have really anything that jumps out from anybody on my end of stuff that I've seen. Thank you, Mark. This is, this is Maureen Colleen. We really have not made any changes because, again, we were fairly aggressive with what we required to begin with. And we know that we will be, um, you know, we like to process our own stuff for the most part. 
So we are careful on our end what we do with it after we get it. So, you know, using the assumption that food itself does not really transmit this virus. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maureen. And for those who don't know Maureen, she works with Beaumont um, and manages the nutrition services there. So she's all up in the heart of it right now. So glad you were here today. Thanks for that. <laughs> You're welcome. Glad it's fun, you. I'll tell you. Glad to see you and glad to see you're doing okay. And Phil, I think that's a good question that we can continue to try to monitor through the network and try to keep communicating about. Um, so thanks for that question. And I could see that being something that we survey our members about maybe down the line um, as things settle in a little bit. I won't say back to normal because I'm not sure I believe in that, but um, as people adapt their approaches as we go, um, I think that's something that we can continue to ask and communicate on. And I know that you and the growers that you work with who are doing um, group gap would be interested to know that. So that's a good question that I think we can keep on our radar. Thanks. Thank you, Mariel. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me. And we will move on to the next part of our agenda here with some perspectives on the state of Michigan's food system. And our first speaker here is Noel Neckreiner, Executive Director of the Michigan Agriculture Council, and I will let you take it away and I'll flip through your slides as you go, Noel. Great, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for allowing me to join you to talk a little bit about um, Michigan agriculture. Uh, so the Ag Council, just to kind of give you a brief uh, summary of what we do, we are a organization of commodity groups from around the state, commodity groups and, or and, uh, and agribusinesses who are uh, committed to communicating the message of um, farming and farmers to consumers and really working to build trust among consumers in farmers and farming practices. And so that's what we do. Uh, so a lot of the information that I'm going to share with you today, I've collected from our various partners. I am uh, by no means an expert in all of these areas. So I just wanted to make sure I share that and that, um, you know, a lot of it I've just gleaned from conversations with them and, and trying to do uh, my best to support them during this time. Uh, so you can go ahead and advance. Sorry, a little pokey here once I have too many pages up. Oh, there we go. So we're going to spend uh, a little time this morning, just a few minutes, talking about some of the challenges uh, that the agriculture um, industry and the food system are seeing in Michigan right now, some of the opportunities that we have, and then um, also I wanted to make sure I connect you to some resources that we have. So we'll first talk about those challenges. We can advance. Go ahead. Um, so some of the challenges that we're seeing, the first challenge we're seeing a lot has to do with meat processing and the fact that a lot of processing uh, plants are being shut down throughout the country. Most recently, uh, Tyson in Iowa announced that they were going to shut down. They were a large, uh, they're a large, uh, sorry, I'm losing the word, uh, <laughs> processing plant for, uh, for pigs and for, um, for the pork industry. And so, um, you know, so the result of these of these processing plants shutting down is that, you know, our slaughter capacity is is decreased. So they're not able to um, process as many animals as they had. And so that means that our farmers are enduring the cost of continuing to feed the livestock that they were planning on sending to the processing plant. And in a lot of cases, um, you know, these systems on these farms are set up like clockwork. And so they have, you know, baby animals being born every single day, knowing that these animals will be going out at a certain age. And so, uh, so you know, it's really providing a lot of backup on their farms because they're having to hold on to these animals longer than what they anticipated doing. But you can't stop, <laughs> you can't stop the, you know, the babies from coming once, once they're, uh, you know, once they've been 
um, bread. And so it's also then, you know, there's the threat looming that we may have to start euthanizing some of this livestock. And, and that is, um, obviously, it's not something that we want to do from a business standpoint, but it also takes an emotional tool on our farm, or on our farmers. And so we're seeing that a lot as well of, you know, this is their passion, and this is the job that they were born to do. And so I hope we there we go. Um, and so we're, you know, we're really trying really hard to support our farmers, um, not just financially and, but also emotionally, you know, through this time. Um, some good news is that other plants are slowly opening throughout the United States and that a lot of Michigan-based plants are still operating at 100%. And then actually, uh, because this is an ever-changing situation and, and things are being changed and updated all the time. Uh, we learned that last night uh, the president signed an executive order um, that forces plants to remain open. And so um, we will see definitely some, some changes there as well. Uh, so we can go on to the next slide. The next challenge we're seeing is that the media is now reporting on a daily basis that there are sh shortages. Uh, they're reporting, you know, potential meat shortages in the coming weeks, in the coming months. Um, and so obviously there is a growing concern among our consumers that there's not going to be enough to eat. And so um, we're, we're concerned that that's going to lead to more panic buying at the grocery store like we saw um, you know, at the very beginning of the pandemic with some of those cleaning and um, hygienic essentials. Uh, so the good news in that is that uh, we still have enough food for right now. Um, storage facilities are reporting that there is an increase in beef supply right now and an increase in poultry supply. Uh, I did see where a chicken, chicken supplies are a little bit down and I don't have numbers for pork, um, but right now there is still enough food, there's ample food, and that's what our farmers are telling us is that, you know, there is enough food to go around. Next slide, please. Uh, and another challenge we've seen, and this was a, happening a lot in the beginning of the month, was the threat of um, dairy farmers having to dump milk. And that's due to the lack of demand for dairy. Um, it's forcing our farmers to dump milk, even though grocery stores at that point in time were limiting the purchasing of milk. And a lot of that is because even though families are buying more milk and drinking more milk, uh, it doesn't make up for the loss of schools being closed who were purchasing milk and the restaurant industry who was purchasing milk. So, you know, we've had farmers in Wisconsin and up in the Upper Peninsula uh, who were forced to dump their milk. Um, and organizations like Michigan Milk Producers and Dairy Farmers of America um, have really been, you know, at the forefront asking grocers to stop limiting the purchasing of milk. And, and I think that a lot of them have at this point in time. And so the good news is the majority of the dairy farmers in Michigan um, in fact, 100% of those who belong to Michigan milk producers have not had to dump their milk, and um, they've actually been working with food banks to, to donate that, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. We can move on to our last challenge, which is dropping market prices. So we are seeing that several commodity markets are expected to dip next month. Uh, because of everything going on with COVID. Um, pork prices are expected to be down 50%. Cattle prices are expected to be down 30%. And then even our crop prices are expected to dip 20 to 30%. Uh, I wish I had some good news to report on this one. Uh, I really don't. It is, I mean, it's a sad, um, a sad thing. And especially after coming off of the 2019 planting season, which was just catastrophic for a lot of our farmers because of how wet it was and the fact that some, a lot of our farmers weren't even able to, you know, to plant at all. And, and there was the no plant uh, that happened. Uh, so, so this is obviously very concerning and something that we are closely monitoring. 
we can go ahead. Uh, but there are some opportunities and some good things that are happening right now. Uh, the first one that I wanted to talk to you about is obviously, as we all know, farmers are not furloughed. Farmers are essential. Farmers are getting up and going to work every single day. They are the original stay-at-home worker, if you will. Um, planting season is already underway in some parts of the state, getting ready to happen in other parts of the state. So far, not so much today, but uh, so far the weather's been cooperating and, and they're able to start planting and getting and getting ready to plant. So that's really encouraging. Um, and then as many people have said, the food, the food chain is safe. Um, obviously, you know, we've all talked about the fact that COVID cannot be transferred among food and, and there is ample supply. So, so we will continue to, to make sure um, our farmers are going to continue to, to feed the world as they have for the last hundreds of years. Uh, another opportunity is that farmers are really stepping up to help right now. Um, Herbrook's Poultry in Michigan, they recently donated 300,000 eggs to Michigan Food Bakes. Uh, UDIM donated uh, $200,000 in grants to food banks to help them support the purchase of milk. Michigan Milk Producers have been donating milk and cheese and all sorts of dairy to food banks to help them keep supplied. And then actually Michigan Farm Bureau agents and staff and members recently donated 1.1 million meals to the regional food banks as well. So we're seeing farmers and farming organizations really step up all over the state to help uh, help those in need, which is fantastic. Next slide. And then obviously, uh, as we've talked about, farmers markets are also essential. So we are seeing a lot of farmers who are selling direct to consumers who are being innovative in how they're selling to consumers and how they're kind of changing their models to be able to do that. Uh, markets are taking the utmost safety precautions to make sure that they're providing safe food. And we're really trying to encourage uh, consumers to shop local. I was on a webinar last week with the Michigan Farmers Market Association talking to market managers about how we uh, ensure that we are encouraging consumers to, to head out to the market and help reduce their fear and uh, make sure that they're being safe in doing that as well. We can go ahead to the next slide. And last, I just wanted to, you know, obviously remind that we're all in this together and that farmers are doing their part uh, to make sure that we are taking this seriously and, and doing what we can to continue to, uh, to feed the world just as, as they always have done. And then next slide, I just wanted to provide some resources that I used and that would be really great if you're looking for more information. So Michigan Farm News has put out uh, every single day, they are putting out more and more articles about COVID-19 and the impact that it's having on farmers and what's going on there. So I would definitely encourage you to head to michiganfarmnews.com to read more about that. Uh, you can follow Michigan Grow, Michigan Great. That's the Michigan Ag Council's campaign. We're sharing great stories about farmers uh, in positive and uplifting ways to help show the work that they're doing during this time. And then last but not least, uh, just the Michigan Farmers Market Association is also a great uh, resource to check out in terms of the safety precautions that they're taking. So thank you very much for having me uh, engage in this webinar this morning. Thanks, Noelle. And I think we're going to roll right over to Heather and then we can kind of round out the perspectives piece before we dive into questions and conversation. So if you're able to hang out with us, uh, we'll handle it that way. Absolutely, happy to. Great. And it, for folks that do have questions, feel free to throw them into the chat box as they come to you and we will um, pin them for the end of this section of our agenda. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our friend Heather at Cherry Capital Foods to give her perspective. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I think that as everyone has sort of already stated, uh, this the response to this has changed every single day. Had I sat down and thought about what I was going to say here the day Colleen asked me to, I'd be giving an entirely different presentation. 
Um, I just want to sort of run through the perspective of uh, of all of the changes from our size and scale of a, a provider, um, just to just sort of share that um, that perspective. Uh, so initially, when um, the first governor's order came out, we saw a stark change in our um, in our in who our customer base was. Um, we went from being a business that is, you know, probably 40% retail um, and the rest split between uh, institutions and restaurants to losing all um, restaurant business, seeing an abrupt halt to institutional business. Uh, I should say school business, which is the majority of our institution business um, and the biggest upswing in retail business that we ever could have imagined. In the week it took us to respond to that, um, you know, get as many dry, uh, canned beans and dried beans and uh, IQF vegetables and retail packs, uh, you know, in that week that we responded, we started seeing yet another shift. Um, while that new uh, retail business didn't go anywhere, we started seeing um, restaurants and schools responding. Um, as we've discussed, schools have done a remarkable job of making sure that, uh, that our community is being fed in these times. Um, I have seen a complete shift in which school districts I work with on a daily basis. It's been really interesting. Um, I've watched a handful of customers who typically buy nine to 18 cases of apples a week start purchasing 50 to 150 cases of apples a week. Um, this is actually a gift to our apple growers who saw a huge dip in a year that didn't see 10 cents a meal. Um, so as it turns out, we have the capacity to finish out the school year strong with a lot of apples moving to school districts. Um, that said, uh, three school districts buying 150 cases of apples a week is as much as our truckloads can bear. So we are, um, we are constantly trying to find creative solutions. I'm, we're actually, uh, you know, look doing everything from looking for bigger trucks to revisiting our food hub partnership conversations and trying to figure out, um, how we can supply um, and and we've done a pretty good job of meeting the school district's needs that we currently have on board it's just what does this look like if the emergency meal program continues into summer feeding or next school year so i'm sure that that sentiment is shared with many many people on this phone call right now um, the other thing that we're seeing is a shift to um, what I'm going to call boxed food programs, which is seemingly the trend in food systems on every spectrum. Um, we have CSA farmers who have turned into buyers clubs and have decided to start um, adding protein and value added products and sometimes dairy uh, to their CSA shares um, and allowing them to, you know, continue to grow their business in this time and keep people out of grocery stores. Um, that, that has happened from everywhere to small farmers to um, local restaurants that are doing similar things. I, I know there's a lot of Michigan State people on this call. Uh, Red Haven has completely pivoted to being a, basically a CSA model. Um, and that way they're able to continue supporting their local uh, farmers and getting their customers food. Um, and we've seen that across the state. Uh, Lady of the House is doing basically meal kits in Detroit. So they are um, packing up boxes, kind of like you would on Blue Apron or whatnot, you know, with instruction kits and a pile of local vegetables and some local meat. And here's what we would have made for you for dinner. You do this yourself at home. Here's our great quality products. Um, the food box program is everywhere. Um, I'm sure many of you know that the USDA has released an RFP um, for, uh, for 
food hubs and distributors to purchase food, um, you know, USDA definition of local being uh, American grown food and repack it into boxes that would go to food pantries, senior centers, um, any at risk communities. Um, the food hub partnership in Michigan has been a great platform. It's I think um, because we have had such a strong local food uh, community in Michigan, it just puts us ahead of the game when these moments arise. There have been weekly meetings of the Food Hub Practitioners Group trying to partner together to respond um, to this pandemic. Um, that has allowed opportunities like food boxes that the Eastern Market is already producing. I'm sure you've all seen that on so social media, but they pivoted their farmer's market to a uh, food box pickup program. Um, uh, they are working with all of their local farmers to try and put that in and you know us as well because we have the food hub practitioners group which if you're not all familiar with um, the Michigan food hub network has a USDA grant to uh, as administered by uh, the Center for Regional Food Systems to partner um, in real tangible ways to have real actionable um, business transactions between the food hubs so that uh, we've had long standing relationships and conversations and this has really allowed us to uh, work together in a, in a new way and so uh, what that means in these times is that we are um, sharing resources sharing products uh, sharing availability sharing um, <laughs> sharing best practices for this USDA RFP um, and meeting weekly at least to uh, continue partnerships. Um, so the general uh, perspective of the food hubs is that like everyone else we are just watching this constantly moving target and trying to react as quickly as possible. Um, everything changes every day. Um, but we are just continuing to do our work of supporting our farmers and getting that food into our the mouths of our community members in whatever ways we can. Um, we are, we have a few uh, box programs in the works that would support hospitals. Um, one hospital, uh, well, one group of hospitals in the Detroit area are working on um, a purchasing program that would purchase pre-made boxes that could then just be delivered during shift change. And so we're involved in a partnership uh, to develop some uh, boxes for that program. Um, and a Ann Arbor hospital is looking to do a box delivery program for, um, for people who have tested positive for COVID but are not uh, you know, sick enough to be admitted into the hospital. So it's funny as I scroll through these pages of uh, participants, how many of my partners are on this call. I'm basically telling you what I'm doing with each other. Um, and I think that's the value of the food hub, right? We are, we are intertwined in this way, in this moment to react however we can. So thank you all for your time and for your partnership and for your innovations and for your pieces of these puzzles. We really appreciate all the good food work that's gone on in these times. Thanks, Heather. And I have an initial question for you around um, that new USDA uh, RFP. Do you see Cherry Capital being in a position to respond to that? We heavily considered um, submitting an application on our own. What we realized from the Food Hub Network was that the various food hubs around the state were responding and we are in the midst of um, compiling all the data needed for a uh, vendor capacity letter which in itself is an incredible amount of work so the actual application itself um, is cumbersome to say the least we for a brief moment decided that what we were going to do was respond in our local community since we don't have a food hub up here aside from us i suppose but we don't have a, a nonprofit prop partner with the capacity to provide these in Northwest Michigan. Um, so our initial intention was to submit proposal for that. 
um, we realized that just in our regular daily business operations, we, and really in particular, our school partnerships, we are blowing our capacity out of the water. Um, and we really just don't have the capacity to simultaneously reimagine our business platform into a box packing program. So we are not submitting a proposal. We are submitting vendor capacity letters to several people. And if anybody else is working on that, we are happy to be a supplier to you if you are packing boxes. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have any questions coming in yet, Garrett? I don't see any in the chat box currently, but um, hoping that we get some either for Heather or Noelle. Yep. And I can ask another question of both of you. Uh, we've heard that presently our farmers are, you know, quickly reacting and um, selling more products online and pivoting to these box sales direct to consumer in a lot of cases. Um, if you could look out a little bit further, maybe in a month or two with also your crystal balls, I don't know how well they're working today, but um, what do you see as being things that we at the Farm Institution Network or other folks who support farms in Michigan can do to help? What do you see as forthcoming needs? And maybe I'll turn it to Noelle first, if you have any thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, just continuing to support uh, local farms and farmers and, and purchase, you know, locally grown products as much as possible as we transition into, uh, you know, as into the summer months and we're seeing more markets open up and, uh, you know, with those requirements and more food side stands, uh, you know, really just encouraging you and everyone in the state, obviously, uh, to be purchasing local as much as possible and in supporting those farmers as much as they can. Heather? Yeah, one of the things that we're doing right now is working with the um, a few nonprofits that uh, administer the Traverse City Farmers Market um, to provide some space in our uh, Food Hub partner shared facility um, so that they can be pack packing boxes of their own. What we're seeing in Traverse is that um, uh, Taste the Local Difference is putting together a online purchasing platform and we will have some sort of boxed food program up here as well. Um, it seems that uh, with an unforeseeable <laughs> future, we don't really know what the future will bring, um, having these no touch boxes is the simplest way to keep uh, progressing and keep farmers growing and keep people getting good food. Um, so it's it's been so interesting to see all of the different ways that bo box programs have popped up. But really the box seems to be the solution to food safety or food security in the pandemic. So and it also I'm also wondering if, if we can um, continue to direct sales to local farmers and vendors and processors and producers and hubs and all of that, everything is, may need to scale up if that's a trend that will continue. So I'm also keeping an eye out towards opportunities to help farmers do that um, in terms of more production and then maybe it's additional processing on farm or maybe it's additional processing um, through other venues but packaging into forms that might be easier to use for what we heard from schools so that's what's rolling around in my head as we've gone through this call today so just wanted to put that out there too. I see Mark Coe on the call and not Brandon but Brandon saying and I pretty much talk three times a day. Um, they are, as always, responding quickly and efficiently to uh, fill in these gaps. And that's everything from a uh, uh, starting up a partnership with, um, 
with a new minimally processed fresh provider out of their facility, um, utilizing their space in the evening time to um, partnering with uh, one of those hospital programs that I mentioned earlier um, to uh, having a new buyer's club where uh, direct to home consumer boxes are being built out of their facility. Um, so I, and that's only speaking to one of our uh, partners, but that one alone is doing quite a bit of great work. I did have a comment come in from Diane um, Connors that uh, she was mentioning that one thing that she heard from food service directors during a Tencent um, network meeting is that they do have the ability to um, distribute whole pieces of fruit and vegetable um, into boxes for families at summer feeding sites. Um, she gave the example of whole green peppers rather than chopped um, and she's going to provide a link for folks to learn more about that. So maybe that's another opportunity for um, us to get to get food out to folks um, that are all gonna be congregating around some of those summer feeding sites. Um, also, uh, Jay, you said you have a question for Noelle. Um, I think the time, the time is right. Let's hear it. <laughs> cool. Um, thank you both for, uh, for your updates too. This is really helpful um, for me when I get questions from farmers, like what's going on? Um, Noelle, my question goes back to, um, the president's executive order forcing plants to remain open. Um, is, is anyone in Michigan, any organizations yourself or otherwise doing anything to make sure that those employees who work in those processing plants, if they're being forced to remain open, that those employees are still protected and screened and like their health is still um, kept at the forefront? Uh, so I, and honestly, I only mentioned the executive order because I heard about it on the Today Show. <laughs> I've not oh. received any other communication about it uh, from any of my colleagues uh, to date. But I do know that um, I work very closely with Michigan Farm Bureau, and, and Farm Bureau has been, uh, you know, every step of the way taking steps to, you know, to keep people informed and to keep um, you know, ensuring that that farm safety is at the forefront and, and they've been working very closely with a number of farmers. So I would say, uh, like I said, I haven't received too much information about this as of yet, but definitely I'm sure as we learn more about it and as we go through today, even, uh, we'll have more information about, you know, what's happening. But but I would say from my perspective, you know, Farm Bureau is, is doing uh, a lot to really, you know, help take care of farmers and ensuring that, that safety is, is at the forefront. Thanks. I'm curious, Noel, if you've heard from any farmers um, that have been thinking about maybe pivoting away from, is that word pivot again, uh, away from maybe some of the different commodity crops, you know, corn, soybeans, wheat, to, to maybe some of these more high value vegetable crops um, that that they're seeing a higher demand for um, and kind of maybe moving away from some of the larger national and global supply chains that have um, seemed to be a little shakier, um, you know, based off of the, the impact of the pandemic. I haven't heard that specifically. Uh, and I, like I said, I'm working a lot with the different commodity groups. So that just may be information that's not trickling down to me yet. Um, I mean, I will say even outside of the pandemic, we've seen farmers for a number of years diversifying, you know, what they do and what they're growing just in terms of because of the markets and, and how things are going with specific crops. So, uh, so I think that that's going to be something that we continue to see even outside of the pandemic is that farmers are going to continue to diversify and to, to, you know, try to do everything that they can to meet consumer demands because that's what it's all about. And I wanted to take a minute, um, Heather had mentioned before the Food Hub Network, and that's convened by our colleague and Mifin management team member, Noel Balachek. So I wanted to see, Noel, if you had anything that you might wanna to add to the conversation. Um, no, I, I um, appreciate uh, everything that everybody's been sharing. I think it's really interesting to hear all the different perspectives. Um, 
I agree that, you know, I think for us, it's just been every week's been sort of a new conversation about what we need to be doing and what's happening at the moment. Um, and I expect next week will be the same. Um, you know, we've all been sort of spending the last couple of weeks trying to figure out um, this USDA food box program, um, which the applications are due on Friday. So after Friday passes, it's going to be switching gears again. So i um, just grateful for the work that everybody's doing and that folks are making the time to get together and share information and, um, you know, keep the collaborations going. So really appreciate it. Thanks, Noel. And if there's anyone else from the food hub or food distributor side of things that has a note to add, we'd be happy to have that here too, to add to the conversation. See a question came in um, from Paula is asking if anyone know if there will be any needs for more grain milling or processing capacity. It's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Noel or Heather, do you have any sense of that yet? Uh, that is definitely not a uh, not an area that I have explored or had any questions come to me about yet. Yeah, I don't have a real specific answer beyond that. Like everywhere, we're having a hard time keeping up with uh, supply, so it seems like for flower supply at least. So it seems like there should be, but uh, our local producers are doing their best to keep up. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have a sense of that? I haven't heard much about grains myself yet either, I have to say. I can just say that our local grain processor um, packer down here, she's pretty small, but um, when the crisis first hit, sales went crazy. Um, and I, but I haven't heard that she um, is at like a, I can't handle this situation. I think she's still operating within her, within her means. Okay. So that might be all we have to offer on that one, Paula. We'll have to keep an eye on that too. No worries. That's good information. Thank you. Any last questions, comments, thoughts? This is a lot to take in. I was wondering, so we're, we're having some struggles down here with just uh, truck capacity and refrigeration capacity, um, which is something that Heather touched on too. Um, and I'm wondering if anyone has had any success with any external partners. Um, we've reached out to EMU because we assume that they're like, you know, pretty low capacity right now. Maybe we can use their refrigeration. Maybe we can even use some trucks for their, from their catering departments. But, um, but that's still like in the works. It's very, very recent. Does anyone have any like um, success stories of working with any local partners for trucks or refrigeration? Uh, it's not my personal experience. Hey, this is Meg from Planted, but we're selling through the new online grocer Michigan Fields, which is partnered with Michigan Farm to Freezer um, to utilize Brendan's additional, you know, refrigeration capacity. So I think that's a pretty good example of a local partnership. Can you explain that a little more, Meg? Uh, yeah, Michigan Fields, they, so it's, Brandon is partnering with Drew, who's a local graphic designer, and they made this business, uh, they had the idea written down, just didn't have a chance to get it started until pandemic hit and presented all this opportunity. Um, so it's basically an online grocer for local products from local growers. So they're trying to make it like online farmer's market, which of course we know there's a lot of bigger companies out there trying to do that, but they're doing hyper local Southeast Michigan Detroit version of it. Um, so they are basically incubated within Michigan Farm to Freezer's huge facility down in Eastern Market. So we deliver there just like all their other growers deliver there. They, I think they also are picking up from some growers, it sounds like, from just chatting with Brendan. Um, then they do the pack and then they're doing logistics delivery right to a consumer store. So does that answer your, your question? That's good information. Thank you. 
Cool. Can yeah. you repeat the name of that, Meg? The grocer? Michigan Fields. It's actually michiganfields.com. Their SEO is not set up yet. So if you Google Michigan Fields, it's going to take you many pages to find it. So michiganfields.com. Thanks, Meg. And other folks from the Food Hub perspective, any, any good stories about partnerships, unexpected partnerships maybe? I think that's a good question too there, Jay, that we can keep an eye on because I would assume here that MSU also is, I know they're still operating some food services for students that weren't able to go home, um, but they did donate a lot of the food that they had on hand um, so that it wouldn't go bad um, and go unused. So I assume that their stores and their, um, coolers, et cetera, at the various dining halls are not being used to full capacity. So that would be an interesting thing to keep an eye on and maybe especially for our Food Hub Network folks, if there are some of those challenges with trucking and refrigeration coming up in this interim time, that we could maybe connect with some of those institutional partners, especially the large scale ones who might have a lot of capacity available to see what we could do. So let's keep that in mind. Yeah, that's a that's a good idea. I, I mean, that I think Jay, what you've mentioned is um, is fairly universal right now. There's definitely a shortage of of refrigerated vehicles and storage space. So, um, yeah. Uh, I have a question. Kind of just came in from Lindsay. Um, just saying, if we have time, she has a question for everyone, just anyone on the call. Um, what long-term systemic changes do you think we might be seeing or will be important to see as we work through this pandemic, um, getting to whatever is on the other side of this? Um, and I was, I was wondering that same thing, Lindsay. I, I think, you know, especially with all of this ramping up and, and, and uh, added capacity, like what happens after this if that capacity maybe doesn't continue and all the, all the different sorts of things kind of post, post this pandemic, how do we see that um, long-term impact and, and maybe shifts systemic changes? So just a small question <laughs> from Lindsay, who is coordinating our Michigan Good Food Charter work going forward. So I'm sure it's coming from that perspective as she's trying to keep that work going as we're all responding um, to the coronavirus pandemic. So um, if, if folks have a response, um, feel free to drop that into the chat box. Long-term systemic changes that we might be seeing or will be important to see on the other side of this. Any thought? This is Maureen, at least from a um, retail food service perspective, I think uh, we're li looking at um, self-serve stations pretty much going away and at least short term. Um, and the things like salad bars will probably disappear because even if you could keep them safe, people won't trust them. Um, and I think you'll see a lot of changes in restaurants with the social distancing and how they you know, how, how the processes work. And I, and I think you will see a lot of people not trusting going to restaurants for a while. Um, some don't even trust the carryouts now. So I think it's gonna be a lot more prepackaged uh, food that we're going to be seeing wherever we go for retail, individually portioned. We've had a lot of donations to the hospitals and we early on set strict requirements for what that leads to look like. We don't accept anything in bulk. We don't accept whole pizzas because we just, you know, you don't know who the last person was that was in that box and uh, did they touch their mouth before they touched anything, you know? So um, we don't allow anything uh, that's not prepackaged and individually wrapped to come in as a donation to our institutions. 
Yeah, yeah Maureen, I did. Republica, ooh, Republica restaurant, I was on the restaurant. He said he went to, he went to you guys and he, he, he accepted the challenge of delivering food to y'all and he was happy to do so from uh, Chef Petro out of Republica. Yeah, we've had a lot of people step up to donate. Um, for us on our end, we've been nonstop. We, we never close our doors, obviously, because of the, uh, but we were told executive order, once the executive order went through, we had to actually be prepared that they would want to release the majority of the kids that we had in the fear that they, they, that they might get corona while here. We were actually successful with all 160 kids we had on site. No, None of the kids here have had it or, or has it. Um, but we had to release 10 kids um, due to fears from the county that they, 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 they're from, that they want them released back into the community. Mm. But the, the governor's executive order was to release the majority of all the kids, but the, 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 the court held off on that because so many kids weren't ready to go back into the community. So that was Xavier Jeremiah. Every resident that comes in, our first intake in two months will be on Friday. Wow. And every resident from that point on, we'll, we'll be getting a full before they even come in, we have to have a, um, they'll, they'll be tested before they arrive in our, in our, in our, in our especially in our facility. And there's a long waiting list of kids they want to send into our facility now because we've kept it pretty clean and sanitized with, with no cases in, our, in both our buildings. Thanks, Xavier, and thanks, Maureen. Um, both are members of our MIFIN advisory committee, and Xavier. He runs the nutrition services for a juvenile residential facility. Um, so there are interesting implications, I think, for juvenile justice, but also for broader um, departments of corrections operations in terms of um, the number of people who are in those facilities and then what their food service looks like as well. Diane Connors, can I just talk? <laughs> Great. Um, I'm finding I can't type my thoughts as well, and I'm afraid it's going to end. Um, I've just really um, experienced a much greater appreciation uh, for food systems generally, you know, the idea of a food system. Um, more and more people are having a greater appreciation for Michigan farms and the capacity to be able to tap into those locally grown products when they're seeing the national food system falter or be in danger of faltering. And so being able to have that for resilience really. And um, so we've seen that when we did our local food relief fund fundraising campaign up here that food pantries were really grateful to be able to see that how much food they could source locally and the connections we're being able to make on that had school systems talk about that as well so those are some things that i'm seeing i'll put it into chat too so you have a record of it but i just couldn't type fast enough thanks diane I see a couple of other notes in the chat there, Garrett. Yeah, it looks like uh, Mark provided some thoughts um, that he thinking that we'll see more local regional sourcing of products, especially from larger store chains, uh, which I think is a, is a really interesting thought. Um, you know, he said they have been left short on many food goods um, and this in turn will lead to an increase in processing needs um, statewide uh, for the whole Midwest region. Um, Jay is uh, just throwing another question out there and I'm wondering if we'll see maybe more of just the deconsolidation de of the food system um, writ large. I'm thinking more, uh, we'll start to see, you know, just, just grow kind of the work that we've already been doing here where um, more regionally focused, more local focused, um, rather than the national and, and, and global food system that we've kind of come to come to know, so. Um, and then Meg chimed in uh, that she definitely will s thinks that we'll see a different um, shakeout of how local food systems work. Folks seem to understand that local to local matters now, um, and that is very exciting for sure. Yeah, if, if one good thing comes out of comes out of this, it's I think a, a 
renewed appreciation for, at least here in Michigan, our ability to produce amazing food locally. Yeah, and to add to that and maybe close up this section for now, um, we, and Heather mentioned it too, we do have really great cooperation and networks already in place around local food and our local and regional food systems work. So that has allowed us to um, together communicate well and collaborate and um, be able to respond quickly and more nimbly than some other spaces might be able to. So from a national perspective, we're seeing that Michigan is really well set up already to respond. Um, in addition to the diversity of food that we have, we have really great people that are working together on all of this. Um, so maybe we can close this conversation on that higher note. And that's what this kind of a network is here for. And we had really great conversation today. I've heard some things that I think we as a network can definitely continue to follow up on, including um, supporting schools as some of the school food scene might be changing. And it sounds like the same is going for hospitals too, um, to be able to prepare food differently, but maybe also buy food differently um, through the supply chain that may need additional capacity um, for prepackaged and or processed foods. Um, and then that trucking capacity and refrigeration capacity thing sounds like something we can continue to monitor. So um, those are some pieces that I think we can make some space to talk through as a group um, and whoever wants to opt into those spaces can. So we'll um, see what we can do about scheduling time and space for some of those conversations to continue. And Lindsay dropped a note for additional feedback as the Michigan Good Food Charter update continues as well. So feel free to be in touch with her or um, provide some of your feedback through her survey link there. So with that, I will Thank Noelle and thank Heather very much for providing their perspectives. It would be interesting to check in with you um, maybe in another month to get some quick bullet updates, if that's a, pot, a, a thing that you can do, uh, <laughs> to see what changes between now and then, because it is changing daily, I know. So thank you for sharing and thanks for staying up on, on it and thanks for what you do. Okay, so to wrap up our conversation today, I just wanted to give a quick look at the rest of our calendar for the year as we have it now. We have um, already had some changes in plans due to the coronavirus and staying at home. Um, we did postpone a Cultivate Michigan marketplace that we had had in the works. Um, we hadn't advertised it too widely yet, but we were hoping to do that. I think it was yesterday. Um, so we had our partners all together and had a date set for that, but we um, canceled it before we had any promotion out and we'll reschedule that um, when the time is right. So we haven't had that conversation just because it's hard to tell when the time is going to be right for something like that. So we'll get back to that when we can and if we can, but I I'm also considering ways that we can do a similar kind of matchmaking event on a virtual basis. I know it won't be the same, but there may be ways we can adapt our Cultivate Michigan Marketplace model for a virtual space too. So for now, all we have planned are more virtual network meetings. I think we can plan a few more um, conversations and kind of planning and working meetings based on the topics we discussed at hand, but it's every other month that we get together. And um, uh, the Good Food Summit, there is no decision yet. Lindsay, you wanna, yep. Okay, it's just it's faster to speak. So hi, everybody. Um, we have not made a decision yet about the summit, uh, but I think we'll be making that fairly soon. Um, one thing I'll say is regard if, if we end up deciding not to do something in person, we, there will be a virtual thing happening. And um, our members of our summit planning committee are on board to kind of think about that creatively and make it engaging and do something cool. Um, so but we haven't made that decision yet. So stay tuned um, to know soon. And we can share that out through our channels too as soon as we hear the definitive answer on that. So for now it's scheduled for November, but um, we'll know soon if we're changing what that looks like. Right. Thanks. Thanks for the question. 
And yes, I can email everyone with these dates and times so that you get them on your calendars. There are also a number of resources and links that came through our meeting today. So what I'm hoping to do is just to send everyone who registered for this meeting a follow up um, because there was a lot more um, to follow up on than we necessarily always have. So I will send a follow up with these dates and times and um, some of those links that we learned about today so that everyone can have those with them. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any more announcements for the good of the group at this time. And I know we covered a lot of ground today, so it's a lot to think about. And I trust that we can all continue to work together. So it looks like the Michigan Good Food Fund has been having some deep dives for small farms and food businesses. I think a lot of that information has been going out on Foodspeak and we've been trying to promote some of it. I know I haven't been able to be on top of it enough to promote all of it, um, but be sure to pay attention to what the Good Food Fund is up to for um, food businesses. Thank you, Trevor, for joining us. I agree that this was enlightening and they learned a lot today and I appreciate everyone's participation. So, not seeing any additional announcements for the good of the group. Uh, we've got a link there from Lindsay, we'll pass that on too. Um, we will wrap it up for today. So thank you all and we'll stay in touch and please do take care and be well. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, Maureen. Yes, thank you all. Bye, Mark. Bye-bye.